spare me, son. It's over. There's no more heroes left in the world. I've wanted to get around to discussing the Lethal Weapon series for a long time and I've certainly had a lot of requests for it. I decided to binge them all in a few days and see how they hold up. Then again for good measure. Yeah, you see crazy? I'll tell you. <laughs> what surprised me was that the experience was enjoyable from beginning to end. Sure, it is a series of clear diminishing returns, but there is a core experience and unlike most franchises, a consistency in direction and cast that made watching the films a breeze. The first three films are basically the same length, which did help, if you go by the theatrical cuts which I will be here. Though it had been a while since I saw the whole series, I am a big fan of the first two films and always preferred their theatrical versions to the director's cuts, and the changes to the third and fourth films never appealed to me. Famously starting as the first produced screenplay of Shane Black, brought to the screen by action film mega producer Joel Silver and always dependable director Richard Donner, the first opened as a mid-budget entry into Warner Brothers' yearly slate without a great deal of expectation. It very quickly turned into a box office success beyond what many could have foreseen however, thanks to strong reviews and the market still having a thirst for this sort of film. You ever met anybody you didn't kill? That it starred Mel Gibson just as he was reaching superstar status helped of course. Originally Black's screenplay was darker, not that the first film lacks bleakness. Jeffrey Boehm, who would go on to write Lethal Weapon 2 and 3, was brought on to generally lighten things up a tad, but not enough to lose that Shane Black feeling to it all. You're not trying to draw a psycho pension. You really are crazy. Though remembered for its tight dialogue and crisp action, what really stands out for me is that central relationship and the thematic setups and payoffs that Black works into the script so well. I'll tell you a little secret. What? I'm not crazy. I know. I really like that the film is less an action flick and more a hard-boiled cop thriller with some great humour mixed in throughout. Commando, this is not. This is about cops doing cop work. Drew? I haven't even started. Even if sometimes they have to go outside of acceptable force to get things done. I got it. The jazz score, working brilliantly for drama and to punctuate comedy, fits wonderfully. I'm too old for this shit. And the cinematography is excellent. There are those that say you're a good cop. I try. I love too that the film begins as a whodunit with a twist. We see this woman kill herself, right? So just what is the mystery here? The film of course isn't so much about that mystery as much as it is the guys who solve it. The shit. In a way that is why it works so well. The mystery is tied to Murtar and those involved related somewhat to Riggs. Roger, that's a special forces tattoo. The narrative, solving that mystery, requires these characters. Only by them coming together and looking past their differences, befriending the unfriendable, can they hope to solve the unsolvable. Ah, that's pretty fucking thin. <laughs> that's very thin. Uh, what the hell, thin's my middle name. Your wife's cooking, I'm not surprised. And boy, those characters. I said the entire series is a breeze to watch and these two are why. Pretty thin, huh? <laughs> Donna's direction helps of course, but really I cannot imagine anyone else playing Riggs and Murtar. It just works. Yeah, okay. <laughs> You'll try. <laughs> the film goes to a point that still feels unexpected. A believable place where the comedy is not only genuine relief but a reflection of who these characters are and in a way therapy for them and us to those more uncomfortable moments. You really like my wife's cooking? No. I love that the plot's real ticking bomb here is Riggs. 
We are waiting for one of the main characters to lose control, taking himself, Murtar, or one hopes the bad guys down as it happens. As Riggs finds light, of course Murtar must plumb the depths, and Donna, as workmanlike as his direction can be, understands that. We're gonna get bloody on this one, Roger. Be it the hellish bathed in red frame as Murtar accepts how bloody things will get, or the somewhat eroticized water-soaked finale that washes Riggs of his sins, Donna understood exactly what this film and its characters needed from him. The action is serviceable, if not as memorable as the set pieces that would come later. Mr. Joshua is a great henchman though, providing the tension needed for the action to work and is an antagonist that smartly becomes the main adversary by the end, allowing Riggs to sort of defeat a darker version of himself. In general, the Lethal Weapon series would never have a villain as memorable as say Hans Gruber or the Terminator, but that wasn't the point. Lethal Weapon was about Riggs and Murtar, and though their difficult but ultimately rewarding friendship comes to a satisfying conclusion by the end of the first film, I got you. Uh, I got you, bud. Its success is clear in just how much you want to spend longer with them as the credits roll. Which of course leads me to Lethal Weapon 2, that quickly released two years later in 1989. Rush though that may perhaps sound, the magic certainly was not entirely lost. I've actually heard many say they prefer the second film over the first, a view that I can certainly understand even if I don't share it. I do want to quickly mention Play Dirty, the original Shane Black Lethal Weapon 2 script, a much darker, bloodier film that focused more on heroism than comedy, with Riggs dying at the end to save Murtar and his family. Though the script was never released publicly, and man what I would do to get my hands on it, it undeniably would have led to a very different end for the series. I would have loved to see what Black could have done with a sequel, as of course he is the creator of these characters and it would have made some sense for Riggs to ultimately give his life for family instead of taking it due to a lack of it. That said, we of course didn't get that film, and I don't want to dwell on what could have been, but instead look at what Jeffrey Boehm did with the characters instead. You son of a bitch. <laughs> I thought you were dying here in my arms. Oh, it is sad we didn't get to see more of what Shane Black could do here, but he basically forged a career out of this odd couple hard-boiled action story, recreating and reinvigorating that microgenre multiple times in his own way. And who knows if we'd have got them had he continued with Lethal Weapon. You put, put a live on. round in that gun. Oh yeah, there was like an 8% chance. Eight percent. Was it just eight? Eight? Lethal Weapon 2 is a change. As addressed previously, Jeffrey Boehm took over writing duties and it does show. Once you accept that this is generally a lighter film and that the characters of course have settled into a new relationship that lacks the original's tension, you do still get something quite special. The budget for one is bigger here, and the story became less hard-boiled as the scale increased. Things kick off this time with a car chase and some genuinely funny humor. 20 bucks on Riggs and Murtaugh. Who's driving? Murtaugh and his wife's station wagon. I'll take it. Wait, I don't know yeah, nothing too. about the wife's station wagon. Back up. Yeah. Really, what they're doing, and it's smart, is setting the tone immediately, letting you know what this sequel is going to be when compared to the original. If you liked Lethal Weapon's central relationship, you're gonna enjoy this. And they were right, it is a new dynamic perhaps now since they're close friends, but we settle into it quickly. <laughs> they elevate the action here too brilliantly, such as the early car chase that's filled with great stunt work and is easy to follow. Generally, the action throughout the second film is an improvement on the first technically, even if there's less of an emotional heft to it. Compare, for example, how the chaotic fight against Mr. Joshua was filmed and edited in the first, to this final fight of the second. The stakes for the friendship are lower, of course, with Riggs now a somewhat less volatile presence and a part of the Murtar clan. And with it being a somewhat functional sequel, we do get the classic introduce a funny character trope with Joe Pesci's Leo Getz. Whatever you need, Leo gets. You get it? <laughs> I use that all the time to break the ice when I meet people. You know, it's good. How's the hanging, everybody? Morning, Roy. Yeah, hi, Roy. Along with a love interest for Riggs. <laughs> I'm sorry, you... <laughs> that said... 
Pesci definitely fares better than Patsy Kensit's Rika, with the latter having almost no chemistry of Riggs. That's a new one. Luckily, she does serve a purpose with her being quite shockingly killed off later and providing Riggs with the fire he needs to defeat the antagonists. I do love that once Kensit dies, the film feels like it has a pretty distinct tonal shift, matching the events of the story. Once we see Rika die, the film never leaves the night time. Things are darker now and they will be until after once again, things get bloody. Diplomatic community! Just been revoked. We end, of course, with a great one-liner from Murtar and a reminder that these films really are a love story. No, oh, don't die. You're not dead until I tell you. You got that? You got that, Riggs? You're not dead until I tell you. If you ended the Lethal Weapon series here, it would unquestionably have been a great two-parter, with or without Riggs's death. But you trembling. Behind the scenes, things began to change after the second film. Though Donna, Michael Kamen and the cast remain, cinematographer Stephen Goldblatt and editor Stuart Baird left the series. The former was replaced by a very effective post-diehard Jan de Bon, and the latter by Battle Davis and Robert Brown. I say this as the series was slowly moving further from its roots as a hard-boiled cop thriller with a comic edge to something more in line with Richard Donner's usual crowd-pleasing works. As the integral members of the original crew began to filter away, that potent cocktail of hard-hitting drama we got in 1987 seemed more and more left behind, even if the films were still enjoyable. Now undeniably, Lethal Weapon 3 is a well-made and very good-looking film, with a cast again firing on all cylinders. They introduce another character here too, Rene Russo's Lorna Cole, who, unlike the second film's Rika, has nothing but chemistry with Mel Gibson's Riggs. You wanna go for a ride? Sure, where are we going? Surprise. Her role is honestly one of my favourite parts of the whole series, with Boehm clearly understanding now who Riggs would actually believably fall for. Sadly, it does mean at times Murtar is sidelined, noticeably so at one point in a way that does make Riggs feel, frankly, a bit of a dick. Oh God, don't Roger, do this he's to dead, Roger. He's dead, Roger. Roger, he's dead. Riggs, how's Murtar? He's good, he's fine. Morning, Captain. I'm not okay. Hmm. Oh, damn. <clears throat> Rianne came to see me, she asked me to find you. But overall, Lorna injects something probably much needed at this point into the series. Put your hands down, it's embarrassing. <laughs> Having the film as well revolve around Murtaugh's retirement is a smart move, as of course the previous films have clearly been leading toward it. For a character who is eternally too old for this shit, retirement makes a lot of sense. I got eight days to retirement, and I will not make a stupid mistake! <laughs> This is admittedly more comedy than thriller by this point, but it is good at what it does and it is easy to watch. The amount of characters threatens to overwhelm things, but that central friendship is strong enough to weather the potential dilution that all of the elements could have brought. I don't care. I don't care. The film feels like, admittedly effective, fan service. Hey, hey, yeah. we're back. Yeah. As said before, the story could have ended with the second film, and by now you're most likely with a series because you are a fan and you just want more. So this film is for you. The action here doesn't quite have so many really memorable moments for me, though of course, as usual, everything is very well performed and filmed. What I remember most about this film, though, are the gentle moments between characters, the tender scene where Murtar shows his son how to shave, the huh? comparing scars scene. Pump action 12 gauge. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. As said before, it is spending time with these characters that it is the real joy of this series, and for all its flaws, the third film simply allows you more of that. It's impossible to really dislike it, as much as at times you may question its creative choices. <laughs> oh, 
The series took its longest hiatus after the third film, with writer Jeffrey Boer moving on to other projects, leaving the lesser-known veteran TV and Cradle to the Grave writer Channing Gibson to take over. Lethal Weapon 4 gets the most negative reception of the series, and it is understandable why. When it released, the action field had changed, with the same year Rush Hour releasing with a somewhat similar plot and very much a debt owed to the original Lethal Weapon. Where that film felt a bit fresher, the formula here was undoubtedly getting a bit stale, and only fans of the series who had enjoyed what Lethal Weapon 3 had turned the series into would really have ever liked this that much. I went into it this time, admittedly expecting to like it less than I actually did. Perhaps it was seeing all of the films so close together that allowed me to lose any weight of expectation, which led me to enjoy the experience. As said again and again too, I simply love Riggs and Murtar, and though the film certainly buckles under the weight of its own numerous plot threads by the end, I'll never not enjoy seeing them together. What took you so long? What took me so long? What the hell you mean, what took me so long? This is more fan service, but sometimes that isn't such a bad thing. Though Jet Li's fight scenes are expectedly somewhat butchered in that edit on every hit style most American action filmmakers applied at the time to this sort of sequence, he does work well. His scenes certainly aren't ruined the way they were in Tomb of the Dragon Emperor, for instance. Murtar suddenly adopting the Hong family feels quite a stretch you have to accept for the drama to work, but it does allow for a number of satisfying action sequences and a truly cinematic end fight brimming with tension and oozing style. <laughs> The action here is actually one of the strongest parts of the film, at least outside of the martial arts. The stunt work is excellent, and though this is one hell of an expensive film at the time, all that money is on the screen. That said, toward the end, things do begin to drag on, with for example Joe Pesci's frog speech not quite landing the way the filmmakers had perhaps hoped, and feeling at best superfluous, and at worst, kind of uncomfortable. Uh, I had this pet frog, his name was Froggy. He was my best friend in the whole world. I used to kiss the frog too. That they also choose to have Pesci seemingly more involved than Murtar during the birth of Riggs's child is a strange choice, but it's undeniably affecting when everyone finally gets together at the very end. Are you all friends? No! Yeah. We're family! The full film is full of very dated race humour, which is a shame, but otherwise, it's another easy watch that whilst feeling a world away from the first film, feels like an expected conclusion to the series as a whole. It is the one I'll return to least perhaps, maybe as much as the third, but it's always nice to know that this is where these characters ended up. There's always been talk of a fifth film, even from Shane Black, but I don't think we need it. There was an unofficial Lethal Weapon 5 and 6 put together on what looks like quite a low budget by some sex-obsessed jabronis in Philadelphia, but I wouldn't consider them canon. <laughs> Things were wrapped up as well as one could hope with the fourth film, and with the TV series finding something of an audience and positive reception, along with the cast and director pretty much aging out of doing another one, I'm pretty confident that is how things will and should stay. It has some of the best cinematography and stunt work of the American action scene of the time, along with very memorable music that lends it a distinct identity rarely seen in franchises then and now. The main thing it stands up to though is proving how powerful casting can be and how integral understanding the relationship between characters and the audience can be. Shane Black didn't want to make the big budget crowd pleasing blockbuster and that is clear but his characters were adopted by others and achieved something really quite special in the Hollywood machine. When seen as a kind of bloody action packed sitcom the Lethal Weapon series works where many other franchises failed. We got one absolute classic in the first film, one of the best action films of the 80s in the second 
and two of the best examples of fan service you could get in the multiplex. If I sound like I'm being a bit easy on the series, I am. The films don't hold quite the same place in my heart that, for example, the original Predator or Die Hard do. My first introduction to them was as part of a four-part set, and that is how they remain in my mind. I may have been too young to fully appreciate the first film truly for what it is till now, but I'll certainly never be too old to enjoy the whole series for what it became.